So Nick, thank you very much for having us out. It's, um, I remember the conversation we had over online when you offered your property for us to come and have a look at. So I think it's what now, seven months later and mm. we're finally here. We've just had a look around the property um, and that was fantastic. Um, I'm from dryland country, so um, in the hills and I know nothing about water systems and obviously that's a very integral part of what you're, you're doing here and how you're farming. So just a little bit of background for everyone, Nick. Um, what sort of enterprise do you run? Um, you know, what's the history of the area and sort of acreage of your property and stuff like that? Yep. So we're on um, 80 acres here, or 30 hectares. It's an ex-dairy farm. Yep. Um, so we've been here since 2007. Uh, we moved across from the Mallee. So mixed beef cropping, that's um, not common where I come from. What, what made you go into that sort of uh, enterprise, given it's ex-dairy? Okay, so um, we, we, we run it as a hobby farm, essentially. So we both work off farm. Yep. Um, we, we purchased, we came into the area and we wanted to move onto a farm um, so that the kids had a rural upbringing and got involved in that, that side of things. You've made a choice about doing both um, enterprises. What's guided that sort of choice? Uh, so it started out as a cropping enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did that because uh, it's it, my background. I understood that a little bit better, but also it was easier um, to manage when you're working off farm. Yeah. Um, but the the cropping side of things, I guess we found a little bit risky yep. um, for this sized area. So because we've got a, a relatively small area, we use contractors to do everything yep. to keep the the farming system flexible, and so we're not um, invested in in any one technology. Yeah. Um, but what we found is because we use contractors to do things, we uh, so one crop species, one variety, um, one planting time, and that exposed us then to uh, market risk and also to uh, climate risk. So if there was a, we, we got one crop wiped out by um, uh, frost and you know, there's always risk of hail and, and, and that sort of thing. So we've ended up moving away from cropping a bit. I think uh, these smaller properties, extra area, there's a lot of infrastructure for beef. Yep. Um, so we've moved more towards that direction, but we've still tried to keep the system really flexible so that we can um, bring in big machinery, we can we can crop it to some extent. Tell us about some of the innovative things that you've got on your farm that um, enable you to do both cropping and um, beef. Yep. So we, when we first bought the property, we, we took out a lot of the internal fences. It had a, a nice central laneway and two hectare paddocks, uh, 16 two hectare paddocks. Yep. We took out most of those internal fences and just had four larger paddocks. Um, but we kept the, the, uh, uh, the reticulated watering system. Um, and, and what we've done since then is put in 10 metre gates across laneways and between all of those large paddocks. Um, using um, quite cheap cocky gates. It's quite expensive if we're going to have these big gates everywhere to, to put in proper gates. But they're gates that we don't use very often. And then we've uh, recently re, um, reinstalled fencing every two hectares, but we've used quite temporary fencing, temporary um, semi-permanent end assemblies that are easy to erect. And if I want to pull them down to re-laser the place at, once, at some stage, we can do that quite easily. Uh, but we can we can quite easily split the farm up uh, for the livestock, but then open it up and crop it and, and bring large machinery in um, to keep that flexibility. True cocky saving money. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's got to be. Um, you, you don't want to skimp too much in certain areas, but certainly there's always we're always looking for ways to save money and innovate, and uh, and I enjoy tinkering around, trying to think of new ways of, of doing things easily and. Um, and more effectively. So flexibility is being a big part of the um, farm design, I suppose, um, and that's enabled you to look at different markets. When we're thinking about climate change and the importance of water on properties, what are the things that you've um, established or maintained on your property to secure that water? Irrigation water is really important to us, but we, we don't use it how the previous owners would have used water. Um, they, they would have had permanent pasture and irrigated most of the farm. We use it much more strategically as, a, as another input, just like um, 
fertilizer or, or growing a, a particular crop. So whenever we, we don't own any water, we purchase water on the temporary market. Um, and we, we look at the, the value of that water um, at any point in time um, and, and weigh up what we can grow with that water and whether we're going to use it or not. So we've had situations, uh, 2018, where we bought water at $320 a megalitre and turned a, a failed crop into an eight tonne hay crop, which was highly valuable. So um, whereas last year water was more expensive again and we didn't, we didn't use any because it wasn't um, economic to do so, this year we're using water at $140 a megalitre to, to irrigate pasture. So uh, we just use it, we, we weigh it up. So is that complex? It is, it is. It's, it's, there's always risk. So whenever you're deciding, you've always got to decide uh, how, how much growth are you going to get out of that water um, and is it going to rain uh, tomorrow and, and, and offset the need for that water. So it is, it is complex and, and then water logging is an issue obviously if we, if we irrigate um, yeah. and, and it gets too wet. So it is complex to manage but uh, you get used to that and it's something we've all got to get better at. But tell us a little bit about your soils and how you manage those um, in terms of um, productivity. Yep. So we're on, uh, it's a floodplain soil, um, Lemnos loam, which is probably one of the most common soils across the area. Uh, it's a, a, a fairly loamy topsoil over a heavy subsoil, so it's really well suited to flood irrigation, which we've got on the farm, uh, because it's, um, we don't get deep percolation, we don't get a lot of water loss uh, below, the, below the soil, but what is more important is making sure we don't get water logging, so having good surface drainage and having a reuse system on the farm, which we're looking at developing that, um, or we need to improve that on our particular farm. Yeah. But soils are really important. We're fortunate coming out of a, a dairy situation that our fertility is quite good, but we do soil test regularly. Um, but the other side of it, very, very conscious of the nutrient removal um, with mm. growing hay and cereal crops. Mm. Um, so we've We've seen the nutrition, uh, the nutrient uh, deplete in the yeah. soil when we've when we've cropped, and so you've got to monitor that. We do nutrient budgets of all our yeah. crops and see how much is we're exporting, and make sure that we're putting that back in fertilizer or in manures. Um, and we find now we've moved to more livestock that um, we're not removing as much nutrient with with the livestock, which is good. So it sounds like there's a lot of behind the scenes thinking that's going into it. I can see a full-time job just sitting here um, listening to you um, just on farm, but you said you've got another job as well. Um, you have a partner in crime that helps you manage the farm, I take it? Yep, yep. So Marisa, my wife, um, she's yeah equally interested in the farm and she's really interested in um, managing climate risk and that sort of thing and revegetation and, uh, and looking at things quite differently. It takes two people on a farm with a family to manage off-farm income, you know, the property, the enterprise. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about your role, because I know that you've got, you're more than just a mum who works in the kitchen. So yes. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so my background is um, essentially I came from a farming family up over in the hills, Mary Jig as well. Ah. So I'm coming from a farm over there. Kindred spirit. Yes, that's right. Beautiful part of the world. Yep. Um, so for me, um, but since work-wise I'm very much in, involved in climate change, energy management, um, that sort of space, sustainability. So for me with the farm it's always been um, the, the challenge between managing a farming enterprise but also keeping the environmental values of the land that we're operating on. Yeah. Um, so for me native veg on farm is very important. Um, so when you say native veg on farm, what, yep. what are you talking? Uh, really trying to provide habitat for the wildlife. Um, that use our farms and really yeah. looking to have make making sure we have all the three levels of the, um, the vegetation. So you've yeah. got your trees, you've got your sort of shrub sort of layers and then your ground story layers and making sure that, that all of our you know species, birds and all that sort of stuff, particularly our woodland birds have got habitat um, so they can move around. And probably one of the things I'm proudest about this, this farm is the amount of beautiful birds that we have on the trees, uh, on the farm. We've done lots of revegetation on the farm and you really see it with the birds that are, you know, flitting around all the time and yeah. Okay, so of... you've noticed that change over yes. time. Yeah. And you've put in some vegetation. Yes. Um, so tell me about that. How, how long ago was that that you did that? Yeah, it's been a bit of an ongoing process, but probably about oh, probably about 10 years ago, we got a land care grant um, to fence off some um, area of the farm. Um, so we put in a really wide shelter belt, we um, protected a couple of remnant trees there and we did some understory spe species planting with that yep. um, and that's grown really, really well. And it sounds like you've done a bit of planning though to come up with that. Was that part of your process? 
Yeah, well, for me, it's, it's been, I, I sort of really want to target at least minimum 10% of the farm to go onto native veg, um, or if I could get it. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was just really, both, both of us basically looking, um, looking, sitting down, looking down together and going, where are the areas that we can put veg in and where we can't. Um, yeah, great. So you've been um, the product. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Because there's no doubt that work, working around veggies, it can be challenging. Um, but it also does then have the flow on benefits to the stock um, and I know there's a lot of work in this space but but in terms of the climate change you know I really see that the um, you know there's probably a few key areas that we need to manage and heat stress is definitely one of them um, so we find that we, we get pretty intense sort of heat waves and heat and it's only going to get worse under a changing climate and we do find that the cattle obviously need the shade you know yep. we, we know that the growth rates will decrease as yep. if an animal is stressed our, our um, enterprise is basically to try and get the cattle um, to sale as quickly as we can. The longer you have the cattle, the more emissions they have. So the quicker that we can, you know, yep. move the cattle through the system, the better it is emission-wise as well. Yep. So it sounds like um, um, that's been a big part of your planning. Um, and we saw that today, didn't we? We walked out mm. in the paddock and there was, um, at I think it was 10 o'clock and it's quite a warm day today. So, mm. and they were under the trees yeah. already. Yeah. yeah, and we were fortunate when we bought the farm, the previous owner had done quite a bit of planting as well. And we've got a couple of really good deep heavy shade areas on the farm. Um, so certainly in terms of management, you do have to be thinking about that. When we know we've got a heat wave coming, you know, you really have to work out where the cattle are going to be. And, and they much prefer being in the, the really shaded areas yeah. than out on another paddock. So it's, yeah, constantly managing that, that heat load. So um, you've, you've done all of all of the planning behind the, the shade and the shelter and, you know, reveg and bringing wildlife and birds back to the property. Is there anything else that you focus on um, for the farm itself? Uh, yeah, so in terms of the um, farm business, yep, uh, I tend to do all the books, <laughs> all the bookwork, all the tax work, that's always fun. Um, but also trying to get the kids involved with the farm as well. For us, it's really important for the kids to understand you know, how their food's produced, um, what goes into it, the work that goes into it, all that sort of stuff. So they've got that really good understanding. I mean, um, probably more and more you find people disconnected from where their food comes from. So yeah. for the kids to be able to, you know, help on the farm, you know, ride, you know, muster the cows, you know, keep an eye on that sort of stuff. They really can see that whole process um, about how the food's, the food's produced. And I think that's really important for everyone to, to be aware of, um, yeah, the decisions that get made and, and be involved with the food process. Yeah, and it's, this this has really highlighted to me the importance of partnerships on farms and how each person brings a different perspective and how they can work together. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and certainly and certainly part of the, um, the the bigger picture strategic planning for the farm. We we recently did a um, well, updated our whole farm plan and yeah. we're involved in the plan, uh, plan to farm uh, process and that was a really good uh, opportunity for us to sit back as a farming family and and see where where we were, where the farm was at the time, and then where we wanted to get to. Um, so we made some strategic decisions about that. Um, and for me, it was a good opportunity to incorporate some of the climate change uh, planning and predictions. So we, we you know, under climate change, we know we're gonna get more of those heavy downpours. Um, as an irrigation property, the, the property is lasered and we know where the water's gonna run off to, that yeah. sort of stuff. Um, but at the moment, we've only really got one runoff point, one yeah. recycle dam. So what we're planning to do is um, change a bit of the way the channels flow and have a couple of areas where the water can run off to. And another thing that I suppose we got impacted by a sort of extreme weather event last year. So um, middle of um, uh, winter last year, we had a freak tornado go through the park. Um, so we were basically watching, it sort of came out of nowhere and watching sort of virtually trees snap off and fly across the paddock. And um, and so as, as a result of that, we it, it, it was the first time we'd really thought about how those extreme in, events can impact on the farming business. Um, we're, we're very busy anyway yeah. with, between you know off-farm work and all that but then to have virtually fences down, trees down everywhere. Our central laneway that we used to manage all the stock that was completely covered in trees, the fences broken yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So the time it took us to actually um, clean up all of that um, uh, it was really time intensive and that's not something we'd built into the system to be prepared for those sort of events that come along yeah. and really disrupt the whole the whole system. Right. Yeah, and are there key points in the year that you go, all right, we need to sit down and plan? Yes, or... <laughs> there definitely is, yep. <laughs> yep. So yeah, certainly before we put, you know, whatever properties for the year, um, yeah. we'll be looking at that. We're also looking at, you know, do we need to take, do we want to take holidays anywhere? Is any period of time where yeah. we're going to be away from the farm? In which case, that might influence what we do on the farm during yeah. the year. So yeah, you're really trying to sit down and work out what's what are the family needs for the year, what's the work life balance sort of looking like, and then the seasonal forecasting. What's that? 
likely to, you know, like oh, knowing that anything could happen, but what's the most likely I put it, you know, at the time. So yeah, trying to keep a handle on all that stuff. Yeah, it's good fun. Well, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> You're welcome.